Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Hezbollah launching a powerful missile barrage against Israel while Israeli forces hit Beirut and keep up their assault on Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Amid all of that fighting, Iran's president warns Israel of unimaginable consequences if Israel retaliates against Iran for its massive missile attack earlier this month. But Israel's defense secretary has his own response. Here at home, anti-Semitism on U.S. college campuses did not go away when the anti-Israel protests ended earlier this year. One analyst tells CBN News it could get worse and threaten academic freedom. And who will control the Senate after this year's elections? We're going to take a look at the key races because the answer to that question could determine if the next president is successful or not. All those stories and more are ahead today, right now on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We want to begin this half hour in the Middle East where Hezbollah is launching more rockets at Israel while Israeli forces are hitting Beirut. And Iran's president at an international summit in Russia warned Israel against a strong retaliation for Iran's massive missile strike on Israel back on October 1st. Ynet News reports the Iranian president said Israel might cause us some damage, but the response it will suffer and the scale of the damage inflicted will be unimaginable. And Israel's defense minister made clear his country is ready. The Times of Israel, of, the Times of Israel is reporting he told pilots and air crews at an Israeli Air Force base, quote, after we strike in Iran, everyone will understand what you did in the preparation and training process. All of that as Israel is keeping up its attacks against Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Chris Mitchell reports now. He's in Jerusalem. More than one year later, Israel is making significant strides to defeat the Hamas terrorists who committed the worst atrocity against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Since October 7th, a year ago, Israel has achieved most of its strategic objectives when it comes to Gaza with the idea of making sure that October 7th could never happen again. The IDF claims hundreds of Hamas terrorists in Gaza have surrendered in recent days. The military also released information claiming six Al Jazeera journalists are affiliated with Hamas. Up north, Hezbollah fired more than 130 rockets into Israel, while the IDF continues to pound Hezbollah targets throughout Lebanon. Retired General Amir Avivi, head of the Israel Defense Security Forum, tells CBN News Hezbollah is being defeated. The morale is very low. They are scared. They are running away. Uh, occasionally, uh, they put some resistance, but much, much lower than anything we, we expected. Uh, so overall, if we continue to attack systematically, uh, there is a chance that we'll see this organization uh, militarily dismantled. Amir believes this might be the time the Lebanese could reclaim their country. We are hoping that uh, in Lebanon, the Lebanese people and the different groups in Lebanon, the Sunnis, the Christians, the Maroonis, the Druze, will seize the moment and really get rid of uh, Hezbollah. Lebanese member of parliament Nadim Gamayel, a Christian, blames Hezbollah for Lebanon's woes. They got themselves into this crisis, and they need to bear the responsibility. They should not think, not even for a second, to come to us and ask us to bear the responsibility. We will not solve the crisis for Hezbollah. In order to solve its crisis today, Hezbollah needs to hand over its weapons. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Chris joins us now from Jerusalem with more. Chris, clearly many people in Lebanon don't want Hezbollah there, but how difficult would it be to expel them from the country uh, or to defeat them? Well, Ephraim, if you asked that about a month ago, you would say it'd be very, very difficult. But what's happened in the last month or even more is that uh, Hezbollah has been dismantled and decapitated uh, its leadership in so dramatic ways. Uh, Lebanon actually has been entrenched there since uh, the early 1980s. Uh, but what the Israel is doing is they're dismantling the military structure uh, throughout southern Lebanon. The villages along the border have been uh, taken over by IDF forces. Uh, the economy is being, which Hezbollah ran a shadow economy there in Lebanon, that's being dismantled and demolished. Uh, you know, billions of dollars have come from Iran and other sources into Hezbollah, and now those coffers are being uh, literally dismantled. Uh, so. If you ask that, like I said, about a month ago, you'd say maybe very, very difficult, but it's getting increasingly easier 
to see that Hezbollah may be diminished as a military and a political force inside Lebanon. Chris, how serious are the ongoing Hezbollah attacks on Israel? Well, they're very serious, Ephraim, and potentially uh, very deadly uh, because not only of the rockets, but sometimes the interceptors, uh, the debris comes down and can hurt or kill people and damage property. So they're very dangerous. However, having said that, uh, Ephraim, uh, Yuav Galat, the uh, Israeli defense manager, says that Hezbollah has depleted or they have destroyed uh, about 70 percent of their rocket arsenal. And so they're actually depleting those rockets day by day. So uh, you, you wonder how long they're going to be able to continue this, much like Hamas did in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they were actually in, been able to fire uh, missiles for maybe several months. But once the IDF captured and destroyed most of those missiles in the Gaza Strip, uh, Hamas hasn't been able to fire any missiles. Hezbollah, it looks like the same thing will happen to them, that they, uh, given more time, uh, they may not be able to fire the missiles. And this, this really danger that Israel had been facing for many years may be uh, eliminated. Israel is talking about striking back uh, at Iran for its missile attack earlier this month, while Iran is warning of unimaginable damage to Israel in response. What is the thinking there about an Israeli strike on Iran? Well, the thinking is it could come soon, uh, you know, maybe in a few days and maybe before the U.S. election, which is going to be very pivotal uh, to the whole uh, region here. Uh, but also it remains to be seen uh, how significant that attack is, what it's going to be doing to, uh, to perhaps military structures or the leadership uh, in Iran. It seems like they may not go to the nuclear facilities or the oil facilities but still they're promising a significant attack against Iran. Uh, when Iran promises these uh, responses, you have to wonder sometimes, here in Israel anyway, they fired 350 projectiles on, on April 13th. They fired 181 ballistic missiles on October 1st, but they caused very little damage or, or loss of life. So uh, it remains to be seen what kind of capabilities Iran has to, uh, to really strike back uh, at Israel. And Israel, I would say, and many people are thinking, this could be a tipping point not only in Lebanon, but also in Iran, when these regimes and Hezbollah in Lebanon can really be defeated. There could be, uh, you know, a new era of peace and prosperity. That's what our guest, uh, Amir Avivi, believes could happen in the near future. How much longer does the Israeli government believe the war against Hamas in Gaza will last? Well, it's getting very close to the end, uh, Ephraim, but how long it will last. Uh, you know, many of these Hamas uh, terrorists, as, as we sh showed in our report, are surrendering, uh, and their, their military capability continues to be degraded. Uh, it may be in, go into some sort of an insurgency uh, inside Gaza, but uh, it looks closer and closer uh, that what people have called the day after will come to Gaza and then they will decide exactly what's going to happen to Gaza, who's going to be in control uh, in civilian affairs as well as uh, military and security. But getting closer and closer, Ephraim, we don't know exactly when that's going to be, uh, but a lot closer than it was one year ago. Israelis and Jews worldwide are celebrating an important feast today. Tell us about that. Well, here in Jerusalem, the streets are very quiet. It's a national holiday. Uh, when they call Simcha Torah, that means the joy of the Torah. So many people will be in synagogues and even outside in parks taking the Torah itself and being able to shout and dance and sing. Uh, it is a little bittersweet because uh, people remember what happened one year ago on the last Simcha Torah. That fell on October 7th. Uh, because of the Jewish calendar, it's a different day this year. But still remembering what happened on October 7th uh, last year uh, when people were celebrating and then this horrific atrocity happened. Uh, but we're looking forward to hopefully better days uh, here in Jerusalem and Israel and the entire Middle East. All right, Chris Mitch reporting for us from Jerusalem, our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief. We appreciate your insights. Insight. Stay safe and know we we'll back here continue to pray for you and our entire team there as well. Coming up here at home, the threat of anti-Semitism on college campuses is far from over. One analyst tells CBN News it could actually be increasing and poses a threat to academic freedom. We're gonna hear from him. We got the story for you when we come back. 
Download the CBN News app. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Get the CBN News app today. Get your daily quick start from CBN News. A quick read on the important news of the day delivered right to your inbox. Stay current on breaking news, politics, and entertainment. Go to quickstart.news and subscribe today. Anti-Semitism on U.S. college campuses did not end with the crackdowns on pro-Hamas protests. Now it appears college professors are institutionalizing an ideological shift which could threaten academic freedom by, in, by endorsing boycotts. Appearing on this week's edition of The Global Lane, Campus Reform Higher Education fellow Ken Tashi contends the American Association of University Professors has abandoned a 100-year tradition. During that time, they have sought to preserve and advance uh, academic freedom uh, across higher education. And really what that means is preserving the ability to engage uh, in open debate discussion and dialogue among academics, to engage in research, whether it's across town or across international boundaries, regardless of governmental policies. Uh, and in that role, they have always opposed the use of academic boycotts, and they've always viewed those, uh, the use of that tactic as antithetical to academic freedom. And an academic boycott is when an educational institution or organization refuses to engage with other colleges and universities because of institutional or governmental policies that they don't agree with. Uh, and as I indicated, the AUP has been steadfastly opposed to the use of boycotts against any uh, institutions um, across the country for the better part of two decades. Uh, it was only recently that they have amended and changed that view and perspective, where they now uh, take the position that academic boycotts can be an appropriate method uh, to try to change institutional or governmental policies. And I, I can point to a couple of reasons why I believe that is a, a, a shift away from their principles and in the direction much more of an ideological view and perspective. Well, why, no, why now, Ken? Tell, tell us why now. I mean, they're sure. 110 years old. Why now? Understood. Well, it's no coincidence that they changed their view and perspective on this issue soon after uh, the terrorist attacks on Israel uh, by Hamas terrorists. Um, it, it's also uh, no coincidence uh, that their new position now aligns themselves with the campus protesters and the protests that we saw rage across campuses last spring, which we know resulted in a disruption of the educational environment, uh, which, which caused destruction of property on campuses, uh, and which resulted in intimidation and threats of Jewish students. Uh, it also aligns them now with the views of the BDS movement, the Boycott, Sanction, and Divestment movement uh, that has been called for uh, across the country by a variety of organizations, including Students for the Justice in Palestine. And lastly, it aligns them with the position of its uh, union affiliate, the American Federation of Teachers, which has lost no opportunity to minimize anti-Semitism in higher education, calling the congressional investigations nothing more than a witch hunt, and who uh, actively and full-throatedly supported their faculty's participation in those disruptive protests. So they really look to have abandoned their principal stance opposing boycotts and now uh, embrace this ideological view, which to many is anti-Semitic. Well, what academic boycotts then do you expect to see? Will we see one against companies who do business with Iran and its development of nuclear weapons? Uh, who will they demand universities boycott? Well, exactly. That, that's the right question. Um, you can go back to 2005 and 2013 uh, when uh, the AUP opposed uh, proposed boycotts against Israel. Um, and, and again, since that time, they have never endorsed or supported an academic boycott, whether it be against China, given their uh, discrimination against the Uyghurs or the Tibetans, or whether it be against Nigeria and their silent genocide of Christians, or frankly, in any other country. So the question becomes, why now? And, and I think the, the answer is because it is an effort uh, to, to further that anti-Israel sentiment uh, that we're seeing spread across college campuses. Ken, on another issue, university issue, is the presidential election approaches in the classroom, a University of Kansas professor advocated violence against men who refused to vote for a female for president. It's what frustrates me 
there are going to be some males in our society that will refuse to vote for a potential fe female president because they don't think females are smart enough to be president. We could line all those guys up and shoot them. They clearly don't understand the way the world works. Did I say that? I, scratch that from the recording. I don't want the deans hearing that I said that. Anybody who's seen the, the clip of this faculty member should be appalled. Um, and there are some out there that are claiming that he has some degree of academic freedom to have engaged in this kind of conduct in the classroom. And I'm going to assert that this has nothing to do with academic freedom, but this is, is just academic uh, bullying. Uh, and not the kind of bullying you talk about in the schoolyard. This is uh, uh, this is where an individual in a position of power, the faculty member, uses that power to intimidate, threaten, and coerce subordinates, and in this case, students, um, who disagree or have a vastly different view or perspective than the faculty member. Uh, and that is antithetical to anything having to do with academic freedom, which is really based on open debate, discussion, and dialogue, trying to encourage your students to uh, uh, be engage in critical thinking and intellectual discourse and intellectual curiosity, none of which is going to occur in a classroom where a professor tells you if you don't agree with him, in essence, you should be put up against a wall and shot. Okay, I will say that he was suspended. Ken Tashi. Campus Reform Higher Education Fellow, thank you for sharing your insights. We appreciate you. Oh, Gary, thanks very much for having me. Also on this week's episode of The Global Lane, North Korean troops reported in Ukraine. What did Putin promise Kim Jong-un in return for the favor? And Exterminating Black Americans, a new documentary film, exposes the truth about abortion and Margaret Sanger. You can see it all on The Global Lane tonight. On the CBN News Channel, it begins at 8 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app as well as on YouTube. Still ahead, while the focus is on the presidential race in this year's election, key races will also decide who will control the Senate, and that will have a major impact on the agenda of the next president, whoever it turns out to be. We're going to bring you the story when we come back. You're watching CBN News Watch. With only 12 days to until Election Day, the presidential race is getting all the headlines, but it is the battle for Capitol Hill that could make or break the next president's success or failure over the next two years. Control of the Senate is up for grabs, and several key races are extremely close. CBN's Capitol Hill correspondent Michelle London shows us which candidates to watch for in the run-up to November 5th. With a total of 34 Senate seats up for election, there's a lot at stake. The majority party will have power over the next president's cabinet appointments and judicial nominations, as well as influencing their legislative agenda. As Democrats cling to a slim 51 Senate seat majority, 10 competitive races in these deep red states threaten to shift the balance of power. Democrats have to defend every single incumbent. They cannot lose a single race. And they also need Harris to win the presidency so that Tim Walls would be the tiebreaker. So Given that no situation, we asked that Jessica Taylor of Cook Political Report which states to keep a close watch. She sees the most critical being Republican-leaning Montana, where incumbent Democratic Senator John Tester stands to lose his seat. His toughest challenger and most well-financed, best well-financed challenger in Tim Sheehy there. He is um, a former Navy SEAL served in Afghanistan, Purple Heart recipient. He owns an aerial firefighting company there. And we have seen in polling that he has been pulling ahead of Tester. Sheehy's possible defeat of Tester is widely seen as one of the GOP's best chances to reclaim the Senate. Another key red state to watch, West Virginia, where longtime Democrat incumbent Joe Manchin is retiring. I think Democrats would have had a tough time even defending that seat Republicans have seeded that. We, we rate that race as actually safe Republican. If this happens, Senate Republicans would only need one more victory to reclaim control if they're able to avoid upsets elsewhere. In the battleground of Michigan, voting has already started and a tight contest is underway for the state's first open Senate seat in a decade. 
A critical test for Democrat Rep. Alyssa Slotkin as she faces off against her Republican opponent, former U.S. Rep. Mike Rogers. Rogers, he was chair of the House Intelligence Committee during the Bush years. Now he retired from Congress in 2014. He's a former FBI agent. He struggled to raise money. Slotkin has outspent him, but Michigan is just going to be very close. In neighboring state Ohio, the Senate race is now considered a toss-up, where Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown is running for re-election. Taylor sees Brown as vulnerable against Republican candidate and Trump ally Bernie Morano. We're seeing polling out now. It's, it's within the margin of error. A Republican poll this week had it tied. It's still going to be close. And it, it might just be that that's too much for Sherrod Brown to overcome, too, for those number of crossover voters. Brown currently holds a four-point lead and 10 percent of Trump voters. That's according to a September New York Times Siena College poll. However, Trump is expected to carry Ohio in the presidential race. Looking ahead at high-profile battleground Pennsylvania, many election watchers are talking about this ad from Democrat incumbent Senator Bob Casey. Casey bucked Biden to protect fracking, and he sided with Trump to end NAFTA and put tariffs on China to stop them from cheating. Analysts say while this shows Casey's ability to be bipartisan, they also believe it's a result of Vice President Harris losing ground in the state, which could affect other races. Republican challenger Dave McCormick is moving up against Casey, and the Cook Report just shifted the race from lean Democrat to toss up. There is little room for error in Pennsylvania, as well as other states like Wisconsin and Arizona, where results at those polls could play a decisive role on who controls the Hill come November. Michelle London, CBN News, Washington. Be right back with an encouraging word for your day ahead. Stay with us. Download the CBN News app 24-7 News from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Hi, I'm John Stolnes, host of the CBN News podcast, DC Debrief. Each Friday, get the inside scoop on Washington politics straight from the nation's capital. Because truth matters. Start listening today. It's time now for your Thursday. Thankful. Hope you'll join me in this prayer of gratitude. God, thank you for another day. It is a day that could be filled with problems, but it can also be filled with promise and possibility. I get to choose, and I choose your promises. They're bigger than any problem, bigger than any fear, bigger than any mountain, seen or unseen. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News. I want to remind you, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online. That address is CBNNews.com. Take a moment and let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can do that by emailing us. That address, newswatch at cbn.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. We'll see you back here same time tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.